We're continuing our um, series on the Baptist distinctives. We're near the very end of our series. And I really appreciate all of you just <coughs> coming with me step by step through each one. So we're still on the distinctive, the Baptist distinctive of two offices in the local church. Uh, we talked about the last several weeks the office of the pastor. And he is given to the church for its edification, for its building up. Now we're going to go to another office that God has instituted in the church, and it's the deacon. We're going to start in verse 8. It says, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double tongued not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. That verse, specifically verse 13, we'll definitely dive into today. That's a very uh, special verse for deacons. But let's start with an open word of prayer. Father, thank you for this Sunday school hour. Thank you for those who are here. And Lord, thank you that today is Mother's Day. And we want to honor, Lord, all the ladies here, ladies here who are mothers, who have sacrificed themselves to take care of their children and grandchildren. Even. Lord, would you make today special for them? Lord, as we open up the Word of God this hour, I pray that you would speak to us. Would you challenge our, our hearts, our thinking? And Lord, I pray that discussion would follow. That there would be questions and a real understanding of what this passage is all about. And I ask, Lord, that you help me to be simple and not complicated. Help me to say only what needs to be said. I look to you for guidance. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, the book of 1 Timothy is what I would call the pastoral handbook. This is a book that Paul wrote to the young pastor Timothy to give instruction on what uh, order should be instituted in the church. And chapter 3 is all about order regarding who should fulfill the pastoral office, and now we're going to look into the deacon office. We need to ask ourselves this question. What is a deacon? <laughs> Have you ever asked yourself that question? Uh, if, a Bi if the Bible talks about something, you need to know what it is before you can actually study it or figure out what God intends for that. So, what is a deacon? What is a deacon? We're going to look at the biblical data here really quick. First of all, it's a transliteration of the Greek word diakonos. The noun form diakonos here occurs 30 times in the New Testament. 30 times. Not all of them are found in 1 Timothy. They're scattered all throughout the New Testament. And we're going to look at some, um, some verses here to give us a, a, an idea of what the word deacon means. What diakonos means. You find in the New Testament several different translations. Uh, the word diakonos can be translated servant. It can be translated minister. And obviously the transliteration deacon. And when I say transliteration, I mean simply taking the Greek sounds of the Greek word and putting it into English. 
So we have the Greek word diakonos. You put it in English, it's deacon. Similar phonetic sounds. We just put it into our English language. Okay? So these are three different translations. Now we're going to look at New Testament instances of the word. Let's go, hold your finger in 1 Timothy 3, and let's go to Matthew chapter 20. Again, this is only just the noun form. The uh, verb form is also in the New Testament, but just for sake of simplicity, we're just going to look at the noun form of the word. Okay? Matthew 20. Who would like to read verses 24 to 26? Verses 24 to 26. Good. One you want to? Yes, sure. Okay. And uh, when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Thank you. So the context of this uh, passage here is that uh, you look at verse 20, uh, the mother of Zebedee's children uh, came to Jesus, that would be uh, James and John's mom, talked to Jesus. She talked to Jesus and uh, verse 21 she says, she asked Jesus, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. In other words, Jesus, when you set up your kingdom, have my sons be the one, your right and left hand men. If you were the other ten disciples, what would you think? Any ideas? You can shout them out if you like. That's not fair. Yeah. What else? Wouldn't you feel a little jealous? Like, what's, what's so special about James and John? <laughs> what about Matthew? Not Judas Iscariot, of course. Obviously not him, but what about Andrew? Philip? Bartholomew? What's wrong with these men? Why these two special men? And Jesus basically tells her, um, you don't know what you're asking. <laughs> And then in verse 24, when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two. It sounds like little they, they, it's act, They're acting like little kids. It's amazing how adults can act like kids sometimes. Really. And you and I may need to take inventory in our lives and realize, hey, we're, sometimes we can act a little immature when it comes to things. And the disciples were no excuse, were no, were no um, exception to the rule. Twelve grown men arguing over two men who want to be in the kingdom, who want to rule. Verse 25, Jesus tells them, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, that they're, that, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. Giving the idea how Gentile rulers exert authority. Jesus says, you're not supposed to be like that. It shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your deacon. That's the idea of the word minister. That's diakonos. Go to chapter 23 now. Mm -hmm. The mother was looking out for him. She had ambitions. That's true. I didn't think <laughs> of that. Ambition, ambitions for her sons. She loves her sons. She wants them to do well in the millennial kingdom. That's fair. Good, good observation. I didn't see that. We're in Matthew 23. Now we're looking at another um, example of diakonos. It says in verse, uh, verse 8. We'll start with verse 8. I'll read it there. But be ye not called, be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. 
Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your deacon, minister, your servant. So, diakonos has been translated minister, servant. So it sounds like the deacon office, just based on outside of 1 Timothy, is an office of servitude. Giving of themselves for the good of someone else. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4 now. So that we're going back to our original passage. First Timothy 4, verse 6. It says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, good deacon, diakonos, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. So, this is my definition. I put it into my words. I'm sure other men and women can do better than I can with this, but... A local church deacon is a servant, a minister appointed to meet the physical needs of the congregation. A local church deacon is a servant, a minister appointed to meet the physical needs of the congregation. Before I move on, any questions up to this point or any comments? Okay. All right, now we're going to go through piece by piece through 1 Timothy 3 now and talk about the qualifications for the deacon office. Number one, we're going to look at his personal character, his personal character. So Paul here gives us instruction on what a deacon, how he should behave, what should we look for when it comes to appointing a deacon in a local church congregate, uh, context. Number one, we find in verse 8, he must be grave. That means he must be someone who is worthy of respect, dignified. Later in our Sunday school lesson, we're going to see that this same qualification is for his wife. Someone that the congregation can respect and I think that respect is because of what he does. He serves the congregation. He meets needs. Secondly, he must not be double-tongued. In other words, he needs to be a man of sincerity and honesty, unhypocritical. He can't say one thing and do another. He needs to be a consistent man. Someone consistent in his word and in his behavior. Thirdly, not given to much wine. Basically, he should not be a drunkard. He should not be a drunkard. Lastly, not greedy of filthy lucre. Meaning, he should not be a seeker of dishonest gain. He should have the highest financial integrity. Think about it. If the deacon is meeting needs of members in the congregation, and if, it, and if he's dealing with someone else's money, you expect him and you should expect him to be someone who's honest with your money. If he has to, do, if he has, if he has to meet a financial need for you, or do something in the financial realm for you. We find in the book of Acts some a couple, a couple who was not honest about their financial integrity. Ananias and Sapphira, where they gave an offering to the church, to, for, to the apostles for the church, to meet the needs of the church. Both Ananias and Sapphira said that this was all that they had, all that they gave. But that was dishonest. Because they said that they took part of it too. 
And what was the consequence? And if, does anybody know? Mm -hmm. Peter called him out on it and said, You have not lied unto men, but you have lied unto the Holy Spirit. And both of them died on the same day. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that that's what God will do to a deacon who does that. But it does give us an indication of how serious God is when it comes to a deacon being careful with money. Any questions up to this point? Okay. Now, his spiritual life. Okay? His spiritual life. You find in verse 9, he needs to hold the mystery of the faith in a good conscience. In short, their theology has to match their lifestyle. Their theology has to match their lifestyle. There have been theologians who knew their Bible, but their lives were not consistent with the theology that they studied. There have been preachers who had solid theology, but later down the line you find that they did not have the highest integrity in their Christian life. Their theology matches their lifestyle. Here's an example. You find in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, being one of the seven that was chosen by the Jerusalem church to meet the needs of the congregation. Read Acts 6 on your own time. We might get into it later, but if not, I encourage you to look at Acts 6. He's arrested, and he stands before the Sanhedrin. This deacon... We assume, as Baptists, that these were the deacons in their first church. This man knew his theology, and he preached a powerful sermon in front of the Sanhedrin before he was martyred. Talk about holding the mystery of the faith, holding the doctrines of God's Word with a lifestyle that matches it. He was a godly man. And how do I know? How do we know that? Because he sees Jesus up in up in the air while, minutes before he passes, and Jesus is standing as a way of respect and honor for this man, for this martyr, holding the faith, mystery of the faith, and good conscience. A deacon must not only know his Bible, but he needs to live out the Bible that he teaches or he uh, adheres to. He needs to be proved. This means that the congregation has to observe that the man and his wife can fulfill the office. The word proved has the idea of being tested. When a man or a woman has a serving heart, everybody can see it. Can't they? And a deacon, if he's serving well, people are going to notice. Or if a man and a woman who, and a wife who love the Lord are serving, the congregation is going to see it. They're going to pinpoint and say, this husband and wife have, have a heart to serve the Lord and to serve people. They've been observed. Lastly, blameless. He's unaccused, free of any charge, from any charge against them. Any questions up to this point? Okay. His family life. He needs to be a husband of one wife. Again, we talked about uh, when we were doing, dealing with the pastor, the Greek translation, the Greek literally says, one woman man. He must be married and has never had any record of divorce in his life. Another one that is similar to the pastor, ruling his children and house well. The word ruling, again, has, does not have the idea of cracking a whip and putting all the ducks in order, or all of his, the soldiers in line. That's not the idea. The idea is management. He can manage his family and the needs of his family 
in an orderly fashion. The, also, the Greek word for ruling has the idea of, of him being in front of. He observes and he understands what's going on in his family. He manages his family well. His wife and his children respect his leadership. Now, do you notice in verse 11, it says, even so must their wives be grave. So this is an office that not only must the man be godly and fitting for the task, his wife must also meet it too. Interesting. Before I move on, any ideas as to why that is? Why God put that there? Let's think for a little bit. Why would God put qualifications for the deacon's wife and not the pastor's wife? Any thoughts? Go ahead. Well, uh, I just thought, I mean, just listening, I thought deacon and minister, like, kind of, it's the same role, no? Deacon and what? Minister. Uh, the, 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 the word deacon and minister are the same English words for the Greek word diakonos, which, which is translated deacon in, in the New Testament as well. So it's the same. So the idea of a deacon is that he's ministering or he's serving. Yeah. But, it's, but I'm, I'm clarifying. Sometimes we say minister, we're meaning pastor, because we say he's the minister of that church. I okay, okay. I think maybe that was the clarification. Is that where you were meaning, Rose, with that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I know we don't have that here, but I know in, in other churches, the pastor and the deacon is two separate positions. That, mm -hmm. that that's why. Mm -hmm. But here, so like the, the pastor and the deacon are two separate offices. Yes. So okay. the, the word deacon itself comes from a Greek word that in its nature has to do with the lowest form of a servant within a household. Mm -hmm. So the woman that washed for the youngest girl in the home that was a slave or a servant that washed the feet of people who came into the house, that would be the, 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 the dirtiest job, the one that nobody wanted, the one that was the person of least seniority. The that minister. Was the that the was minister the to so, the guests in that house. So, you know, basically you're talking the servant, the people who serve tables, the people who was a waitress, somebody in that genre of uh, job title would be considered a deacon. So Jesus, in a society that was very hierarchical, um, was telling them that if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to take upon yourself the attitude of a, of, of a servant. Mm -hmm. See yourself as small and others as big, or the service to others as big. Mm -hmm. And so the, the office of a deacon was designed with that word to keep individuals who are, by their nature in that society, empowered by entitlement or empowered by a title. So to remind them that this title does not make them great, it makes them small. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be great in God's eyes, learn to serve. And so by its nature, it was chosen to remind those who held that office mm -hmm. to not, uh, not to think of themselves highly, but to think of themselves lowly in God's eyes. We will get into that concept in a, uh, a little bit later into our lesson. So, but good point. So again, the deacon is responsible for the the serving. Like he is he is to serve the congregation in any way possible. Now, going back to our original question, why do you think God put qualifications for the deacon's wife? Not for the pastor's wife. Let me ask you this question. Can a pastor's wife fulfill the role of the pastor? Why not? Some things should be obvious. But why? Why can't she fulfill her husband's role? Go ahead. Because the Bible says. The, the pastor preaches and wives are women are not Okay. A pastor's wife can't preach on Sunday morning. However, the deacon's wife can.
can serve the congregation when, when she's called upon to do so. If her husband is not available, she can step in. Uh, there have been times that I've heard of, of uh, let's say, if the deacon, if the husband was on a business trip or something, and the wife was still at home, and there was a family in the church that was needing help, whether it be a death in the family, they needed help getting the funeral ready, she was there to help them organize that. It's a team effort. Both husband and wife can work together to be a godly deacon couple in a church. Now, expectations for the deacon's wife. She also must be worthy of respect. She must be a lady who is godly. Not because of anything special about her, but she just loves the Lord and people know it. She cannot be a slanderer. This is, this, is a, this is an important one. A malicious liar. That's the idea of the word slanderer. You want a husband and a wife to not be quick to make judgments quickly. The godly thing to do if there is a situation in a church that needs a deacon to, or to help fill in they need to get all of the details or the information necessary before making a judgment. Instead of just saying, oh, if there, were, if there was a dispute, automatically saying something. Now, in this case, it's talking about a malicious liar, someone, a lady who actually lies. So this means a deacon's wife must be an honest woman. Honest woman. Sober. She's not given to excess. She can control herself. And this is an important one. Faithful in all things. She is reliable. Again, going back to the idea of if the husband can't be there, she can step in. Any questions before I move on? Yes. Yeah. Well, I could say for, we don't have a deacon here. But our pastor wife is like a deacon and the pastor wife together. She can fulfill both. Yes. Yes, she can. She does it well. True. She does it well. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes, I attest to that as well. And I'm sure Pastor Mead can too. All right. Now let's look at verse 13. This is a special blessing for deacons. And I was excited about it last night. Verse 13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. The word purchase has not the idea of buying something. We think of purchasing as we giving money and we get something back. Like you're going to a grocery store, you purchase food. You give money to the cashier, they say the amount, after gasping as to how expensive it is, you take out the piece of credit of plastic or green money, green paper, and you give it to them or her, and you get your change back and there you go. You purchased something. That's not the word purchase here. The word purchase has the idea of obtaining. It's something that they've earned. And the word degree means, has the idea of standing. So they, the deacon, the, the, the man who um, obtained, who does his office well, and his wife, they have obtained standing. That's the idea. Now, the word boldness is the same word in 1 John chapter 2, if you remember your, our 1 John series, where it says, you know what, why don't we go there? Let's go to 1 John 2. Go to 1 John chapter 2. I want to show this to you. 1 John 2, the word boldness in 1 Timothy 3 is the same word here in, in chapter 2 of 1 John, verse 28. It says, and now little children abide in him, 
that when he shall appear, we may have boldness. We may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You also find in the Gospels when Jesus is, when he's teaching the disciples or anybody, when it comes to being great in the kingdom of God, you have to be the lowest. You have to be the servant. This is my thought on this verse. I could be wrong, but I believe that with Jesus taught in the Gospels, I think I have a case. This is what I think it means. If a deacon humbly and faithfully fulfills his ministry of service well, he will obtain a standing, not just before the congregation, but before his Savior at the judgment seat. When he meets him, he will stand before him confidently. We will have confidence when he will appear knowing that he will hear him say, well done. I think if a deacon does his office well, where he doesn't see himself as somebody, but just a minister, just to be a blessing to the pe needy people in, in the congregation, he will receive rewards for that. He and his wife will receive rewards for that at the judgment seat. God puts a premium on loving service. It's not all about being the big shot. And I, and I mentioned again, the disciples, they were asking him, how do we become the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? We want to be your cabinet, so to speak, dear Jesus, in your kingdom. And Jesus just hits them right over the head by bringing in front of them a little kid, almost like Benaiah. And shows them, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you have to be like that. Humble. Dependent. Not a big shot. But rather, someone who is not only dependent on his Lord, who is willing to be a nobody. To me needs. Whoever shall be the greatest among you shall be his servant. Any final thoughts before we close? All right. Let's close in a word of prayer. Oh Lord, we are so thankful that Lord, that you have given both offices in the church to edify the congregation. And Lord, not every church has deacons, but Lord, churches can have men and women who have a heart of service a heart of being a blessing, being of help to their brothers and sisters in the Lord. I pray that each and every one of us would have that heart of service, putting our brother and sister first, meeting their needs, helping one another. Lord, I pray that, again, that this Mother's Day would be a special day for our mothers in our congregation. Lord, we look forward to what you will do in the morning service to follow. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name.